Ellen, thank you so much for joining us on Kindred Cast today. Thank you. It's really great to be here. I've had the um, luck of being a friend of yours for a few years now, so I'm excited for the rest of the world and for our listeners to understand your story a little bit better. So I want to just give everyone a little bit of an understanding of your background because it's pretty impressive. So you are the Undersecretary for Science and Research at the Smithsonian Institute. Um, That means that you oversee the science museums and science research centers, as well as the Smithsonian Libraries and Archives, the Office of International Relations, Smithsonian Scholarly Press, and Scientific Diving Program. I've read that you attended your first rocket launch at four years old. Your father had a history at NASA. Um, You're a pioneer in many different fields, including Venus geology. So you work in a field that many don't properly grasp. It can feel wildly intangible. Um, How did you manage to hold on to it? And what sort of drew you into, into the space of space? You know, as a kid, I always knew I wanted to be a scientist, but but frankly, there weren't that many role models out there. This was the 1960s, and like, if I went to the library, I would only find books about Marie Curie, which was great, but you know, come on. Um, but my parents got National Geographic, so I would I would read stories about Jane Goodall and about Mary Leakey studying human origins in Africa, and I thought, you know, I could be a scientist um, because these women are out there doing amazing things, and maybe I could too. I didn't really think about NASA, to be honest with you, because everybody who worked at NASA looked like my dad. And my dad was an engineer, and I I wasn't really sure what engineering was. I knew he worked on rockets. You know, it was this weird thing. But, you know, by the time I was, I guess, 14, um, my dad was in charge of the rocket that was launching the first landers to Mars. And we were down in Florida for the launch. I had been going to launches since I was four years old. I've seen a lot of rockets blow up, Um, not with people on them. Um, And... Carl Sagan, who was a member of the Viking mission team, was giving a talk to all the families of NASA folks that were down there about why we were exploring Mars, searching for life, the fact that you could study Mars as this um, analog to the Earth. And I thought, that's what I want to do. I want to be a planetary geologist. And that was what I did. Mars as as a way to study the earth. Um, I do think that's an important point right there because most people, when they think about space exploration and research do really quantify it around everything outside of earth. But obviously it's so interrelated to everyday happenings with individuals and interspecies outcomes. So when you started to embark on that study, did you find that most of the research you ended up doing was related back to earth or that it was more about interplanetary exploration? You know, to me, ultimately, why we are exploring always comes back to our home planet, because it, it, I sometimes use the analogy, think of a, of a doctor who only had one patient. They would never understand the progression of disease like diabetes or cancer. And planets are kind of like that, too. If you really want to understand volcanism, you know, how planetary surfaces change over time, how planets evolve, having only the Earth to study is really limiting. For example, one of the reasons we really understand Earth's climate and how it's changing and why it's changing is because we can look at the climate of Mars, the climate of Venus, the climate of of one of Saturn's moons called Titan that has an atmosphere. So planets, having multiple planets allows you to test models and come back and apply those and understand the Earth a lot better. I study volcanoes around the solar system and I study volcanoes right here on Earth and use that knowledge really to understand how does a volcano work and you need lots of planets to be able to do that. Obviously storytelling and that access to National Geographic was such an important beginning for you and your research and and that inspiration. Um, Did you find that you were always welcomed in the categories that and you know places of work you went into or was that a bit of a challenge as you embarked? You know, I was really lucky. Um, I I had elementary school teachers who knew I wanted to be a scientist and really supported me. My parents supported me. Um, As an undergraduate, I had huge support from my professors who were, you know, when you think back on it, you're like, how, you know, it's kind of weird here. They had this student coming in as a freshman going, I'm going to be a planetary geologist. They're like, yeah, great. How can we help you? Um, And so many women don't have those experiences. They don't have necessarily support from their family. They don't You know, in fact, they get the opposite from teachers or professors. They, you know, literally get harassed. And so I I finally did have bad experiences. Don't get me wrong. You know, as a woman in a field dominated by men, you know, I got called little girl by a coworker. 
Um, you know, I, I was in many experiences where I was made to feel like you're different from everyone else in this room and it's not clear you belong here. So I did have those experiences, but I had them later when I was older and I was a little more resilient. And, and so a big part of, of what I care about now is how do we give girls around, you know, certainly in this country, but around the world, how do we be that voice of support? How do we be that person who's saying, no, you belong, you can do this. If one were to look at your career, it's very fascinating to go from being the chief scientist at NASA, then going into the air and space and then Smithsonian, there is an undercrux of education to everything that you've always participated in. And so how have you seen that evolve to get audiences to care about the true core of your work? You know, you hit on it earlier when you said it's about storytelling, right? And and these are things I care deeply about. Obviously, I love NASA and I have incredible passion for exploration and why we explore and getting humans to Mars. And and the way you get everyone, you know, I want people to share that excitement. And to me, the, the way you do it is through storytelling. Why are we doing this exploration? Where are we going? But then you have issues that have come up, especially in the last 20 or so years around climate. Um, and the planet is facing a climate crisis. And, and so how do we use scientific storytelling to get the public engaged, to get them to understand, you know, we have a biodiversity crisis on this planet. We have a climate crisis on this planet. And, and how do we use the science that we're doing to get the public engaged and to make them realize they have a role in, in you know, secure, making this planet sustainable for the future? But when you talk about the exploration or better learning around Mars, I think most individuals think of that as abandoning Earth or that we're beyond the point of return. And so I am curious about, you know, should, should we be betting more on Earth and what do we need to learn more about to feel more optimistic about the relationship and outcome we can have around the climate crisis? You know, Carl Sagan said it better than I definitely ever could have. And for people who are curious, go read his pale blue dot speech. The earth is where we make our stand, is what he said. There is no planet B. Mars is great. I do want to send humans there. We think life could have evolved there three and a half billion years ago. That would be really amazing to find a second genesis of life and really understand the nature of life itself if we could find, you know, another place where it evolved. But you're not going to move lots of humans to Mars. It's tough. The surface is radiated. It's cold. It's, you know, the air is not breathable. This planet is the planet for humanity. And, and right now we have, we're pushing the planet towards its boundaries. We do still have the ability to pull it back. Are we going to see the effects of climate change no matter what we do about, about carbon in our atmosphere? Yes. You see things like what's happened in Seattle over the last couple of weeks, crazy temperatures huge rainfall. Those are the kind of things that are going to become more common over the next couple decades. We are going to see some degree of sea level rise that's going to be harmful to coastlines around the world. But we still have a chance to pull back if we move towards net zero over the coming decades. We have to do this. It's an imperative. In your career, you probably have had many opportunities to work fully for private individuals, private funded, and you've really worked in the public sphere. Um, maybe with less resources, but a lot more, you know, maybe commitment to some of the core functionalities of, of government and work. Does this mean that nation states need to be working in a different capacity to be dealing with impending, you know, climate refugees or some of these things where, you know, there's sort of the crux of process and financial institutions versus uh, climate needs for Earth? How do we sort of move some of these boundaries that feel like they're moving at a glacial pace for something that, you know, we're, we're already over the, the goal line of, of, of need. You know, I, I think it's all about how do you balance what the planet needs with what human needs, because we can't put human, you know, we're humans in nature, right? We're not humans against nature is what we should be evolving to. How do humans live sustainably on this planet? And for me, while private individuals have a role, right, it is still important that we don't use plastic bags and that we make personal choices around our carbon footprint. Governments have to ask, act. And, and that's why I do work kind of, um, the Smithsonian is a quasi-public institution. You know, I worked for NASA, which is a government institution. And for me as a scientist, the work the government is doing 
is really critical in, in gathering data and that that data then gets turned into information for policymakers to say, you know, should we build this hospital close to a shoreline that's going to affect it, be affected by a sea level rise? Or in the case of a lot of the really cool research we're doing at the Smithsonian, you know, if you create a marine protected reserve, you know, out in the ocean, does biodiversity actually come back? You know, can we make coastlines more resilient to sea level rise to help protect the people that live there? And when you go out into certain landscapes, are there ways to preserve human activity so that you can economically benefit from land while bringing biodiversity back, while reducing carbon footprint? So I think there is, are ways to use science, to use data, to use research, to find solutions to get us through this climate crisis. How do we balance the needs of some of the biodiversity challenges that we're seeing as impacted by humans uh, with, with the reality that we have an ever-growing population? I mean, even in sort of the, some of the responses from the pandemic, how, how do we as a people balance that evolutionary outcome? Well, I think the fact is, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, when you only had maybe three or four billion people on this planet, we could live sustainably, right? We didn't use more resources than the planet could provide every year. And that, that stopped about a decade ago. And now it's about August of every year where we've actually used up our year's worth of allocation of planetary resources. So we really have to think about how do we move that needle back? And, and to me, it's a combination of, yes, we probably say take fishing, there are areas where we have to say, okay, stop fishing. You have to let the stocks rebound, the fishing stocks rebound. On the other hand, there's still people and we need to eat. And so can we really come up with, you know, again, research-based solutions that say, how do you fish sustainably rather than overfishing? How do you combine, you know, uh, you, you know purpose-built fisheries versus just fishing out in the open ocean where we have depleted fishing stocks? So I think it's all about finding sustainable solutions. And I, I'm, you know, I sometimes I'm a pessimist, sometimes I'm an optimist, but I am an optimist that it is, again, humans in nature. And I don't think of it so much as putting humans first. I think it's about putting humans in balance with biodiversity. Uh, you were appointed uh, leader of President Biden's NASA agency review team. And, you know, that team is sort of to brief the incoming administration on activities and ensure a smooth transition of power. You've also been a part of working for many different administrations um, over the course of your career. How much does political affiliation affect space and um, sort of, you know, geological exploration prioritization? You know, it, it, it really hasn't. And, and that's, to me, an incredibly positive thing. I mean, NASA over the years has had incredible bipartisan support. And in fact, you see that right now where um, under the Obama administration, NASA had a plan um, to go back to the moon and on to Mars. Um, the Trump administration continued that plan. And now you see the Biden administration moving that same plan forward. NASA is a, you know, 10, 20, 30 year agency. And it really needs that bipartisan support. It needs buy-in from both sides to be able to do the kind of long-term planning. You know, we can't, you know, NASA can't change every two years, you know, when the House turns over. So, so having that bipartisan support, having that long-term vision um, that everyone buys into um, is incredibly important. And I think over the last, especially over the last decade, you've seen stability in that bipartisan vision for NASA that's really helped it move forward. Both parties acknowledge the earth science work that NASA does is important. Um, exploration of Mars, searching for life in the universe has incredible bipartisan support. And so that makes it a much easier environment to work in. But climate change as a, as a word combination is increasingly polarizing, right? And something that doesn't have as much bipartisan, maybe on the top level, sort of uh, relationship set. So how do you deal with that, which is at odds with each other because climate change as you were talking about and the research that you're doing is interrelated. So how do we address that? You know, I, I feel like that's starting to ebb. Um, and, and you mm -hmm. saw just recently the Republican party formed a climate caucus. And so I, I think there's increasing understanding that the climate is changing and that humans are the underlying cause and that we have to find solutions. Now, do the two parties agree on solutions? Um, no, but, but if you at least agree on the underlying cause, and I think that's reflective that actually, um, 
the, the Yale Climate Center and Pew have been returning a lot of data that seems to show that now there's a far majority of the public, sometimes up in the 80, 80th percentile, who acknowledge, of the public who say, yeah, we understand that climate. And I don't like to use the word believe because it's not mm. a belief. It's a scientific fact mm. who understand that climate change is happening. And frankly, who, you know, when it's 110 in, in Seattle, right, you know, it focuses the fact that the evidence that we see every year um, that climate change is happening, it, it's not some theoretical model, it is actually happening right now. And, and the evidence for that has become really overwhelming. What I think is interesting is, is some of the data the Yale Climate Center has also picked up on is when people get asked, will climate change affect you personally? A lot of people, except people who live right along the coastlines, who are obviously worried about sea level rise, the bulk of the country says, no, it's not going to affect me. Oh, it is going to affect you. And we need to do a better job of explaining how. And I think you see it in terms of you know, temperature patterns, rainfall patterns really changing. For example, the whole Western U.S. right now is in a drought. Did we have droughts before human-induced climate change? Yes, we did. What is changing is the severity and length of those droughts. And so you really have to think. You mentioned climate refugees, you know, especially as we look around the world, we look at vulnerable, low-lying areas around the world where you are going to have to see people moving away from the coastline as sea levels rise, as you get more intense storms. But the thing is, that's going to happen over the next 30 to 50 years. So we have time as a global population to prepare for this. How do we protect humanity from the effects of climate change that are going to occur no matter what we do at this point about reducing carbon dioxide and methane in the atmosphere? We have time to prepare for that. But we need to be working on it in a serious way now. Where do and how do we get people to individually say, climate change will affect me and I need to be a part of maybe, you know, a, gr a, gr a group or a global sacrifice to make that choice? Do, do you believe that's sort of the Smithsonian's job or whose job is it to help create more of that change? I think the Smithsonian has a role to play in certainly reaching out across the country and making sure we're telling relevant stories, you know, whether you live in Los Angeles or whether you live in Oklahoma, we should be talking to those people about what they're seeing, what they're experiencing, what the science is telling us, what are stories around what the story the science is telling us, because you don't want to go in and, and try to present complicated, um, you know, models to people, right? You want to say, here's what, what we think is going to happen in your area over the next 20 years. Are you already seeing the effects of this? So to me, it's going out across the country, across the world, and telling compelling stories of evidence of how the climate is changing, what we're seeing, what we think could happen in the future, and what are solutions. Because you know, one of the things the scientific community has certainly be, ha, been worried about is we don't want to frighten people into inaction, right? Because mm -hmm. you, want to, you want people to understand how serious this is but you don't want them to think, oh, there's no hope. There's nothing I can do. There's nothing that makes a difference. And again, a lot of the research that we're doing here at the Smithsonian is around those very things, solutions. How do we understand how eat various ecosystems, near shore coastal environments where you have things like mangroves and seagrasses um, and reefs that protect our coastline, how are they being affected by uh, temperature rise and, and sea level rise? And are there ways to make those coastal ecosystems more resilient to help protect our coastlines and protect the fish that live there that, that many people rely on? So there are solutions out there. We can use research. We can use science to help, help find those. And then even more importantly, because we're the Smithsonian, talk about that to the, the public so that they say we do see a path forward. Do you ever think about having the Smithsonian work with larger content companies or distribution opportunities to make it so that you're making these topics feel more approachable and not that every sort of option and outcome is a dystopic option? You know, we do. And it was funny at the Air and Space Museum, we actually, um, we, we worked on a, uh, we had a session at one point uh, talking about um, science fiction because at the Air and Space mm -hmm. Museum, we actually hold a lot of science fiction collections. We have the papers of Arthur C. Clarke. Um, and 
I, I actually really love dystopic science fiction. And, and one of the reasons I love it is because if you can articulate the future that you're worried about, it gives people a clearer path to me to avoid it. Um, mm. and, and so why are we so fascinated with dystopic, you know, let's imagine the worst thing that could happen and let's pull back from that and think mm -hmm. about how they got there and how do we prevent that from happening? You know, so many books I've read, you know, crazy, interesting books about pandemics, right? Okay, we just mm -hmm. lived through one. Um, it was certainly a global tra tragedy that we hope is, is slowly coming to an end. Um, but to me, you know, people have been thinking about this and science fiction has been really useful in terms of imagining the future and then we can either invent some of those cool things like tricorders that can, you know, remotely measure your health state, um, which are people are actually working on. But we can also think about things like global pandemics and how how we could better avoid them. So I do think this imagining has an important role. But again, you don't want people to get totally caught up in a negative future is the only future that we can see going forward. There are positive mm -hmm. futures. There are positive outcomes. And the Smithsonian is going to be doing in the coming year a really exciting um, uh, exhibit at our Arts and Industries building called Futures. Um, because of this idea mm -hmm. that, you know, we create the future. We have agency in what our future is. And a lot of the times I think people feel powerless. They feel like they don't have agency. And so one of the really fun things um, that my colleague Rachel Goslins has to, is doing with this exhibit is really going to get people to say, look, there are multiple paths we can go down. Whose decision is it? It's our decision. Um, you know, we're in charge of creating our own future. And I, I, I really hope that at the Smithsonian, we can get people starting to think about, you know, should humans go to Mars? Is that a good idea? Should we be creating hotels on the moon? Should we um, you know, what are the implications of flying cars? You know, how are these things going to change our future? But one of the things that I found um, really interesting was that when Rachel did some some research getting ready for the futures exhibit, a lot of what she heard when she talked, when they went out and started surveying people was the human side. When they thought about the future, they thought about how I want to have close relationships with my family and friends. People actually didn't talk about flying cars. They talked about personal things, personal relationships. And I really love that. That's something that actually makes me optimistic about the future is the fact that fundamentally what we care about are our human relationships, which I think is great. Yeah, I do too. And going back to that notion that, you know, human emotion doesn't change, boundaries change. And so how do we pick outcomes or, or work together on paths that allow for that humanity in each of these decisions to go forward in that choice? Um, you know, I am curious, of course, what you do think about consumer space travel. Um, and if you do think that it, you know, it's on the horizon, if so, is that a good choice? Is that a good allocation of resources? What are you seeing from your perspective? You know, obviously I've made it clear I'm a fan of science fiction and and my favorite sh my favorite um covid <laughs> lockdown show was the expanse um and and so to me this humanity as a multi-planet species once we make it through climate change to me is almost an inevitability that we will move beyond this planet not not to escape this planet, but because it, to me it's in our nature to move outward, to explore, to move beyond. Um, you know, it's what we did on this planet, and I think it's what we'll continue to do in the future. And I think space tourism is just the next logical step in that. Is there an economic model that allows you to have um, manufacturing in space, um, create power in space, um, create new materials, new pharmaceuticals in space? Is there a viable commercial model for hotels in space, hotels on the moon? Um, right now, those things are incredibly expensive. And that's why you've seen um, people like Bezos um, and Musk put a huge emphasis on getting launch costs down. Because the most expensive part of space travel is getting something off the surface of the Earth and um, away from Earth's gravity. And so we're never going to really have viable commercial activities in space until we can drive the cost of launching things and bringing them back to Earth down. And that's where they've put their investment. 
so to me, I'm really excited about this potential era of space commercialization, space tourism. Right now, is it only the domain of the very wealthy? Yes. But frankly, that's the way airplane travel started out too. It mm -hmm. was heavily government subsidized. And at first, only the very wealthy could fly. I guess Starlink would almost be an example of a theoretical innovation uh, where space is sort of the, the link to that, of getting people connected and using space as the vehicle to yeah, do so I really at a faster do, pace. I really do think it's a natural progression. I mean, the history of, of moving uh, you know, forward technologically has been initial government investment, heavy government investment, and then the private sector stepping in when they could see a profit motive, right? The private sector is not going to do something unless they say, hey, I can make money off this. And we've really seen that jumping forward, you know, first with communication satellites, then with Earth observation satellites. And now we're trying to see, is there a human element where companies can see a profit motive? If they can't drive to a profit motive, it's not going to work. Um, and, and so I think that's what we're going to see over the next 10, 15 years is can companies actually make money beyond sort of communication satellites, um, earth observation satellites? Is there, is there money there to be made? Because if there's money, companies will move in. And people often will ask me like, well, isn't that a, are they going to take over NASA? To me, that allows NASA to say, uh, all right, now we can go spend our resources investing for the government on things we should be looking for life in the solar system, looking for life in the universe, moving humans out in an exploration mode, um, not a routine profit making mode. So to me, NASA's role would be, you know, continually pushing those boundaries and let the private sector do what they're capable of doing and they can make money. And one of the questions we talk about a lot here um, on Kindred is sort of this relationship between public and private and how more things have become privatized over the last you know, 50 or 60 years just based on resources and speed and th things of that nature. Um, when you're talking about NASA or this progression, then do you see it as privatization becomes more of the norm and the government resource is you know, the fundamental research underlying, but it's not the facilitating structure? So do, do nation states matter as much in space over time? I think they continue to matter because there's always going to be that harder thing that you want to do that, again, a company doesn't see a profit motive in. Mm -hmm. And so if you say, all right, once we, you know, even once we got humans on Mars and would there be a way for Mars tourism, for example, and so maybe the private sector would even take that over. Well, what would NASA do then? NASA would say, wow, could we send humans out to Saturn's moon Titan? Or they would say, how do we build even bigger telescopes so we can image a planet around another star um, and try to find out, is there an Earth 2.0 you know, mm -hmm. in, in another galaxy somewhere? Um, they would start thinking about how do we really push towards interstellar travel, um, not just travel within our own solar system. So there's always going to be, to me, something that fundamentally there's no profit motive therefore it does stay with the nation state it stays with government investment um and what i love if you look at again you know space in the 1960s there were certainly companies involved nasa had lots of contractor companies but face it it was all government money um now you have private dollars being invested um which is great because you know especially as a scientist that means more is happening more data is being collected. We're learning more. We're moving outward. And frankly, it also used to be right. It started out. It was just the United States and Russia, um, then the Soviet Union. And now, you know, there's over 16 space agencies around the world that are involved in thinking about how to get humans to the moon. So you've got small countries who never could have dreamed they had a space program because the barrier to entry, the cost to entry has come down so much. Um, so it's really exciting. You know, when we get humans to Mars, I think it will be a public-private partnership, and I think it will be international. It won't look like the crew that we sent to the moon for the first time. What would be sort of the decade that you think that could happen in? We are capable, certainly, of sending humans to Mars towards the end of the 2030s, um, early 2040s. So I'm still betting on that. Now, could it be sooner? Yes. If we invested more, it could be sooner. Um, could it be longer if we get 
for example, sidetracked at the moon and um, don't move towards getting humans to Mars. So I, I can see multiple potential paths. I want to see humans on the moon or, or on Mars by the the mid 2030s. And I don't know if that'll happen. And my frustration with that is I really do think that we would find evidence of past life on Mars. And I do think mm. it's going to take humans breaking open a lot of rocks, covering a lot of ground in the ways that our robotic rovers just can't do. Yeah. Um, and, and so that scientific piece to me and the fact I have to wait for it is very frustrating. Mm. But you believe that it will be in our lifetime. That this I, I do. I do. I do think and that. Because again, technologically, and one of the things I always like to say is, you know, in 1960, when Kennedy set the goal of getting humans to the moon, um, we didn't have spacesuits. We didn't have really working rockets, and we certainly didn't have a rocket big enough to get to get humans to the moon. We we didn't have we didn't know how to keep people alive in space, mm-hmm. um, and, and we figured all that out. And you know, nine years later, we successfully landed humans on the surface of the moon. So in my mind, there's no technological things that we can't figure out. We are so far ahead of where we were. We, you know, we know how to keep people alive in space. Um, yes, there are technological challenges to getting to Mars, but it's nothing that couldn't get overcome within the next decade. Mm. And I don't want to sort of skirt away from some of the important work that's happening in the Smithsonian. The Smithsonian has such an incredible archive of our past and so much of sort of public discourse over the last 12 to 24 months has been about reshaping history to be more truthful in its actions. So how do you sort of work with being a representative of the past and also doing all of this research for the future? You know, to me, that's incredibly important because when you talk about things like solving climate, the climate crisis, when you talk about things like, you know, and not to equate them, getting humans to Mars, the only way we're going to be able to do that is if everyone is participating and we're really tapping in to the best minds everywhere. And the only way we're going to do that is to start making science, technology, engineering, math, computing, design, make those things more inclusive than they are now. Um, I spent most of my career being the only person in the room who looked like me. Um, mm-hmm. and, and in my mind, that has to stop. And what I loved at the Air and Space Museum and what we're doing across the Smithsonian is really reflecting on whether we're telling all the stories. Um, You know, most people have heard of Amelia Earhart, right? The first woman to fly across the Atlantic Ocean. How many people have heard of Bessie Coleman, who was the first uh, black woman to get her pilot's license? She had to go to France to do it. This was a decade before Amelia Earhart ever got in an airplane. Um, and, and she went over to France, got a pilot's license, came back and was a barnstorming pilot, um, here in the United States and would only, uh, fly at shows where blacks and whites were allowed to be there together. Um, and she's a pioneer, right? Everyone should know her name. Every kid should be educated about her because I want every kid that walks into a Smithsonian museum to see stories, um, around people who looked like them, who did amazing things. And those stories are there. We just haven't been telling them. And so across the Smithsonian, we're really reflecting on how do we make sure we're telling the story of all Americans. And you just mentioned the museum, and and I think that story is incredibly important. and, And so many more of those stories need to become uncovered. So as you said, the young kid that walks in sees themselves in the future and sees you and is like, oh my gosh, I want to do that. And I didn't even understand this was a piece of how that happened. Um, you know, is the museum actually the function in the future? Like, is the museum physically as relevant as we move towards this sort of digital identity future? You know, clearly over the past year, the Smithsonian has put a huge effort um, into really pivoting to digital, right? Because we had to, all the museums shut down. And it's something, frankly, we should have been doing anyway. We knew that. And we've really pivoted, especially in our educational programs. Um, We have a whole area called the Learning Lab, huge resources for teachers, for parents, um, and and really reflecting on our collections and our stories that we hold. But I do think that there is a role for museums always in the future, because, frankly, there is a 
magic in standing in front of something. For example, the Columbia Command Module that, that took the astronauts to the moon. Um, to Neil Armstrong's spacesuit, which you can stand next to in the museum and say, that thing went to the moon. To seeing the ruby slippers in person, it's magical, right? Because it's, it's a thing that becomes real. And, and so the fact that we do have millions of people who come through the Smithsonian every year um, from all around the world, I, I think reflects on the, the importance of, of the actual, of people having that in-person experience. One of the things, though, that we've really been involved, evolving at museums is how do we tell those stories? You know, you know, when I used to go into museums, you know, when I was a kid, and, and frankly, there's still some out there where you go in the museum and there's like, you know, uh, the ruby slippers will be a label, ruby slippers. You're, you're like, where are we going with this? And what museums are really evolving to is storytelling. How did those slippers change the world? How did that movie, um, you know, become such an iconic cultural thing in this country. And so how do you, how do you bring people into the story? It's not just a thing. That thing holds the story of the people who made it, the people who used it and what, how it shaped this country going forward. And it's that compelling storytelling, uh, that move, that museums are really moving toward. And there's no better example of that than the African American history and culture museum at the Smithsonian where the very way you experience the move, the museum, starting in the basement, in the dark with the story of slavery and moving up into the light. Uh, it's fantastic, really moving experience. One of my closing questions would be actually, which I hadn't even thought about, but what is your favorite item that the Smithsonian has? You know, people ask me that and I always joke, I've got three kids. And so you know, it's like one of your kids saying to you, am I your favorite? No, I love all my <laughs> children equally. Um, at the Air and Space Museum, I was I was totally torn, and this is really funny, between two artifacts. The SR-71, um, which we have an, uh, 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 it was a spy plane, super high um, supersonic plane. It actually, on its way to be delivered to the Air and Space Museum, it flew from Los Angeles to Washington, D.C. in one hour and four minutes. Um, so, it, and it's just, to me, the pinnacle of beautiful design. Uh, which I really love. So I love that airplane. But the other airplane I really love at Air, and it's not a space thing, right? And I'm not a pilot. So you'd be like, why do you love these airplanes so much? But the other thing I really love is we have this cherry red um, Lockheed Vega that Amelia Earhart flew. Um, and to me, it, it's just the fact that it's this defiant red airplane sort of, to me, personifies these early women aviators who had to go up against so much. People didn't think they belonged in the air. People didn't think they should be in air races. People didn't think they should be out there setting records. And these early women aviators defied expectations, defied convention to show that women could perform as well as men could, if not better. Um, and so I love that airplane. But I will say we get a lot of visitors to the museum who say, is that the plane she disappeared in? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> like, no. Well, clearly you um, are an incredible scientist and pioneer, just as a wonderful human being, but also for all of the, the ways that you've pushed forward for work for women and for other people and innovation. So we are very proud to have you on the podcast today. And thank you so much for the work that you do, not only for our planet, but for our solar system and beyond. Thank you. It was really wonderful to talk to you today. Yeah. Thanks, Ellen.